Florence, July 20th, 1861. My dear friend, I can't even yet say of myself whether I was surprised or not by this calamity. I don't know what I feel nor felt. The main comfort is that she suffered very little pain, none beside that ordinarily attending the simple attacks of cough and cold she was subject to, had no presentiment of the result whatsoever and was consequently spared the misery of knowing she was about to leave us. She had been gravely affected by a series of misfortunes, the illness through the summer, Siena the year before last, last year's still worse trial for six months together. Yet on the other hand, her cheerfulness and the quiet of the last six months made everyone say how wonderfully she recovers. She will soon be strong again. Another quiet summer and then, etc. We traveled, as I have told you, easily and with as little fatigue as possible. And on reaching here, I let her repose at will, not asking her to go out, but take the air and exercise of the large rooms to begin with. She saw no one, two or three friends at most, and began to look well, everybody said. But the weather was suffocatingly hot. Last Thursday week, I came in and we had tea, and she said, I think I have a sore throat. I left her with Annunziata, and dressed and knocked up Dr. Wilson, a physician of great repute here. He followed with me, and we found her worse, laboring more ineffectually and distressingly. Wilson was aware of her long previous experience of making shift with damaged lungs and could not say how it might be. It would take a long time to get well. I told part of this to Ba, who answered, It is the old story. They don't know my case. This is only one of my old attacks. I know all about it, and I shall get better. And so she continued. We brought a small bed into the drawing room and placed her in it. And she began to doze very much restlessly. I sat by her. She coughed little, but dozed constantly. If I spoke, she looked, smiled, said she was better. I said, you know me, my Robert, my heavens, my beloved, kissing me, she said, our lives are held by God. I asked, will you take a little jelly for my sake? Yes. I brought a saucerful and fed it by spoonfuls into her mouth. She put her arms round me. God bless you, repeatedly, kissing me with such vehemence that when I laid her down, she continued to kiss the air with her lips. Her last word was when I asked, are you comfortable? Beautiful. Then she began to sleep again, the last. I felt she must be raised, took her in my arms. I felt the struggle to cough begin and end unavailingly. No pain, no sigh. Her head fell on me. I thought she might have fainted, but then there was the least knitting of her brows, and Annunziata cried, 
quest'anima benedetta è passata. It was so. There was no lingering nor acute pain, but God took her to him as you would lift a sleeping child from the dark uneasy bed into your arms and the light. Thank God. My life is fixed and sure now. I shall live out the remainder in her direct influence, endeavoring to complete mine miserably imperfect now, but so as to take the good she was meant to give me. I leave Italy at once, having no longer any business here. I have our child, about whom I shall exclusively employ myself, doing her part by him. Penn has been perfect to me. He sat all day yesterday with his arms around me, saying things like her to me. I shall try and work hard, educate him, and live worthy of my past 15 years' happiness. I do not feel paroxysms of grief, but as if the blessing she died giving me, insensible to all beside, had begun to work in me already. She is to be buried tomorrow. How she looks now. How perfectly beautiful. I never suspected the existence of these sonnets from the Portuguese until three years after they were written. Yes, that was a strange, uneasy crown, laid on me unawares three years after it was twined. All this delay because I happened to say something once against putting one's loves into verse. And then again I happened to say something on the other side one evening at Lucca and the next morning she said hesitatingly, Did you know I once wrote some poems about you? And there they are if you care to see them. And there was the little book I have here with the last sonnet dated two days before our marriage. How I see the gesture and remember the tones, and for the matter of that, see the window at which I was standing with the tall mimosa in front and the little church court to the right. Afterward, the publishing them was through me. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with the love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, sighs, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death.